again, I'm very, very thankful to Joe's heart, and I, I think one of the things I really love about Joe, we've talked many times when it comes to our testimonies, that God gives them to us for a couple reasons. One's to hold on to and remember ourselves when we're going through tough times of the faithfulness of God before, as well as to share them with others to be able to encourage them and lift them up. And that's a big part of what I want to talk about today is what is a testimony? I know we've talked about it as a church uh, many times before, but I also want to talk about if we look at our testimonies incorrectly. That's one of the reasons I love about Joe is he, he's looking at it correctly. Uh, it can actually lead us to some dark places, and we have not talked about that before. So let's talk just a little bit about our stories and about testimonies. If you've not been with us before, I want to just kind of do what we've been doing oftentimes when we do sermons. We'll define kind of the main word we're looking at because we define words differently depending on our past or our culture or whatever the case may be. Sometimes you and I are talking about something and we'll think we're agreeing and we're not. Jenny just had a similar situation with this work. They were talking about the concert. One person thought this con- concert was this and she thought it was this. Ended up causing some additional conversation if we don't have the same definition. So just to define the word. A testimony is not a story. They're not the same. A story, we all have stories. We're all building stories, whether it be with our families or our jobs or our goals or whatever the case would be, we all have stories. A testimony is a specific type of story. It's basically a before and an after that has Jesus right smack in the middle. That, that's the uh, testimony. This is what my life was like before, like Joe was talking about, and uh, where life led him, with the choices that he made, the places that had put him. But then when he read John 3.16 over and over again, the Spirit just made it alive to him, and he's crying, and he's giving his life to Jesus. Things look different afterwards. This is the, what Jesus did in my life. Just like Joe said, this is not my testimony. This is the testimony of what Jesus did in my life, with his love, his grace, his mercy, bringing me back to purpose and to passion and into a lifestyle. And any story that we have that follows along this is your testimony. I know a lot of times when we think about testimony, we think about this is how I came to know Jesus the first time in my life. When, when I, I, I realized he was calling out to me, and according to Scripture, the way that we come to Jesus is that we acknowledge with our mouth he's the Son of God. We believe in our hearts he died and rose again, and we follow him. That, that's the, usually the testimony we talk about. I, I came to him at a church camp. I came to him at a church. I came to him when Grandma was talking to me. I came to him when I was in a prison cell. I came to him when I was walk, driving down the street and listening to Caleb. And this is the difference he's made in my life. But every story that we have that follows us is a testimony. Because we continue in cycles where we're living in this world. We're not of it, but we're living in this world, and there's still trouble. There's still things that come into place. So every time we come to Jesus and there's an after, that's a testimony that we have as a benefit for us and for others. The challenge is, is some people don't realize that it's cycles. And when we're talking about something like Back to Church Sunday, and we're talking about people giving church another shot, or taking and stepping back into maybe their relationship with God, or something to be curious about what that would look like, a lot of the reasons people have stepped out have to do with not really understanding how testimonies work to the point that we have kind of an unrealistic expectation of them and can lead us into giving up or disappointment or disconnection instead of connecting into him. Uh, a lot of times that might start with something where a pastor did something that hurt them. Or maybe they had not the pastor leadership's all fine, but the connections within the church, they had a group of friends they felt very close to, and then their confidence is betrayed. Or someone stabs in the back, or they find out they're being talked about in a way that's not fitting for the church. And I thought these people were supposed to be Christians. And they, they get disillusioned and, and walked away. And I know not everybody's story is that, who are not involved in church. Some of us maybe just were never raised within that, checking out for the first time. But for a lot of people, it could also be something like, I moved, and I just haven't found a new church yet. It's hard to find a church sometimes. Um, or, you know, I, my job schedule changed, or other things came up on the kids' schedule, and the Sunday mornings are busy, and when they're not, I'm just so tired, I just kind of want to take the day off and sleep and those type of things. But I'm going to suggest to you that many cases... Those stories come back to the same thing I'm talking about with our testimonies having unrealistic expectations. Because if we are experiencing Christian community, if we're experiencing Christ at a level that what the Bible says it is, where it's changing our lives, and that's where our passion and purpose is, and we can do more with others than we can do by ourselves, and that's where we're encouraged, that's where we cry with each other and laugh with each other, 
and pray with each other, if we're experiencing that, then a move or a schedule change of priorities would be a no-brainer. If I'm experiencing that versus what maybe it wasn't quite what I thought it was going to be, I'm going to look for a new church before I look for a new grocery store because that's where my fuel, that's where I'm being fed, that's where I'm having my community is going to be high up within the bars, which is something that we talk about a lot here and challenge ourselves to live into. So I think for some of us, it's that when this doesn't work as neatly as sometimes we hear them, we get discouraged. Does that make sense? Again, Joe's testimony encourages the daylights out of me. It encourages daylights out of me. But if we think this after is going to look a little different than reality, it can be discouraging for us. So what I want to do is to take our remaining time and look at one more testimony, but we're going to look at one from the Scripture. So if you would, we're going to go into Luke, if you've got your Bibles with you. Uh, we're going to slap that up. Yep, Luke 5. Couldn't remember if it was 4 or 5. And I want to look at the testimony of Peter. And again, a lot of people have heard of Peter. If uh, you, you know your scripture, originally he was, was named uh, Simon. And I want to look at his life because we have a lot of information about his life. Um, and sit, look at his testimony and kind of pull some of this out from it. Um, again, Peter is a real guy. And I want to make sure we just stop and realize that because a lot of times I think we kind of see them through the Hallmark movie end of things and that kind of lens instead of realizing this is a real guy with a real testimony. And so if we were going to look at him from a testimony standpoint, we need to look a little bit about who Simon was or who Peter was before he experienced Jesus. And I'll just kind of put some of that onto the board. He was a Jewish guy, which means... He went through that same system we just talked about two weeks ago. As a little boy, he would have been taken into the synagogue. He would have been educated from the time of kindergarten to about fifth grade. Again, those who excelled with straight A's became Pharisees and Sadducees and religious leaders. Those who didn't moved into more manual labor jobs. He was not a straight A student. Okay? So he's kind of a, uh, we'll we'll give him straight C's. And we'll give him a plus there, just give him the benefit of the doubt. So he is not going to be raised within that religious system as far as one of the leaders. And he goes into manual labor, and he takes over the family fishing business with his brother Andrew. And he's got some partners with John and James and their dad, the sons of Zedebi, and they're doing business. And so we know that he didn't necessarily go to the advanced classes, but we know that he has a basic understanding about God as you would as a Jewish young man. And we also know that he's in. It's not something he's like, well, that's my dad's religion, and I don't have anything to do with that. He's in because at the beginning of the story, we're going to see when Andrew comes, he says, Simon, we have found the one we have been looking for. There was an expectant heart about the prophecies that we have all through the Old Testament about the coming Messiah, and so they have been looking for him. He's not at the same place as Andrew where he's out looking for him, He's kind of at the same place that some of us fall into. Yeah, I know Jesus is going to come back again someday, but probably not today. That's kind of where he's at within things. He wasn't searching, but he's waiting. So we have that about him as well. Wow, that's handwriting today. In other words, Peter is okay. Peter is okay. And this is one of the things I liked about Joe's testimony, because he says, I have a dynamic testimony. But a better testimony is being with the Lord since four and moving on. This is kind of in this verge of things. He's, we're not finding him in prison for the wrong reasons. We're not finding him where he was a prodigal son who asked his dad for his inheritance. He's doing okay. He's doing like most of us do in our lives. I know about God. I'm, I'm, I'm walk, walking generally with God. I'm doing my, my job. I'm doing it well. Things are moving forward. Things are okay. And I'm going to be fully honest with you, I think okay is just as dangerous as a place as being in prison itself. Because we stop looking for the fullness of what God has. We start seeking for those things. We're just kind of going through the emotions. And then, Jesus. Let me read through this with you a little bit. And again, you've got the Bibles with you, and there's Bibles underneath the chairs around the room if you need one. You can keep ours still, or you versions up and running if you're using your tablet or whatnot. But I want to walk through this a little bit and look at his experience of what happened when he came to know Jesus personally. 
Starting at verse 1, it says, On one occasion, while the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he was standing by the lake of, yes, and he saw two boats by the lake. But the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. Getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, again, his name before Jesus changed it, he asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people from the boat. So it kind of sets the scene a little bit. Peter's fine. Things are going good. Probably a little annoyed because Andrew hasn't exactly been pulling his weight here lately. They're not having a good day fishing-wise either. Maybe a little bit grumpy. Maybe a little bit overwhelmed. Maybe feeling a little bit deflated. And then comes into this situation where Jesus comes in. Again, we know from the harmony of the Gospels that Andrew is the one that brought him. And he takes an ass as the crowds are coming in to take and um, put him out into the boat. And so he taught the people from the boat. And I never really caught this before. There's a book, uh, if you've been around for a long time, you've heard me talk about it before. It's by Michael Card called The Fragile Stone, for those who like to read books. And if you don't, you know I'm not a big book reader, as far as just casually, just mostly for study. Uh, I, I devoured this book. Michael Card, The Fragile Stone, still available on Amazon, but is an older book. As a matter of fact, the first sermon series I did for the Shepherd's Fellowship 15 years ago, a little 15 years ago now, was based off of that book because back then I was a young pastor and didn't know how to do this without taking and saying, hey, let me tell you what Michael Card told me. Um, incredible book because what it gets into is the fact that Peter was pretty much Jesus' best friend on this earth. And looking at their relationship that we can learn about what our relationship with Jesus could be like too with his best friend. So in that book, I was kind of thumbing through it this week uh, again and kind of looking through some things. And he was talking about what an ingenious way it was for Jesus to start to transform these guys from fishing for fish to fishing for men. is by getting into their boat, by going out just a little bit, by teaching. I thought that was pretty cool how Jesus works. Verse 4. When they finished speaking, Jesus said to Simon, Put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. Simon, an expert fisherman, answered, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing. But at your word I would let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish, and their nets were breaking. They signaled to their partners, which we assume again would be James and John that they worked with with their father. They signaled them in the other boat to come help them. And they are so filled that both of the boats began to sink. So we see just this miraculous act of just Jesus coming in. Now, Peter has not necessarily declared him as Lord yet. He's calling him Master because he's listened to his teaching. He realizes he's got a following. He has a place of respect for him. But this really is a big asking that that Jesus has done because for them to get the nets out, I mean, they've just spent a couple hours cleaning everything up. So to do this is really setting them back. But he said, okay, I'll do this. If nothing else, just to get the guy off my back. Verse 8. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, depart from me. For I am a sinful man, O Lord. If you've not had a moment like that somewhere in your life, you might not fully realize what has happened when Jesus saved you. In this moment, when Simon realizes, when Peter realizes that Jesus is the one they've been looking for, he is the one they've been waiting for, this is God incarnate. This isn't just a guy that kind of knows his Bible frontwards and backwards. This is God that's in front of him. He goes from being okay to saying, I am just not worthy of you. I, 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 my only response is just to ask you to leave. I, I'm not worthy of anything that you have for me. That's when we're really set up for great. That's when we understand the Bible says if we humble ourselves before God that he'll lift us up. Is when we stop t- talking and looking at all the things that we have created and at all the foundation that we have put together and realize it's for not when you're coming face to face with Jesus and you realize, I'm a sinner. That's the moment that Simon had here. If I pick it up in the the second part of verse 10, it says, Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you will be catching men. And when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed Jesus. In this moment, when he realized that okay was not good enough, this simply disappeared. He simply walked away from everything. And I I don't know how I would react. I don't know how you would react 
if tomorrow morning you had an angel show up in front of you and says, God's got good things for you, but you've got to quit your job now. And just trust me. I, I want you to give up your house and just trust me. I, 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 I know that your family's probably going to think you're nuts. Just trust me. And I've got a life for you. But that's exactly what Simon found himself in. And to be honest with you, that's the moment that all of us find ourselves in. That there's nothing that we can have between us and the Lord. But when you embrace the Lord, everything changes. Um, let's talk about the after in P- Peter's life. Uh, he gets to become a, a disciple. That's pretty cool. That's a cool win. Walking with Jesus, learning from Jesus, being taught with Jesus. And he's not only just a disciple, but he's really in the top three. Everything that we look at, when Jesus is calling them a little bit further in the garden to pray, when he's calling them to come up when he's meeting uh, at the ascension, when the special moments, he doesn't take all 12. He takes Peter, James, and John, and Peter's in that boat. Matter of fact, Peter, whenever we see him listed in the Gospels, is listed first because he is the lead apostle. He's the one that they look to the most. As I said, he's Jesus' best friend. That's a pretty cool win. And we see a very real relationship between the two of them, not just I get, Jesus says this and Peter goes, yeah, okay, whatever you want. But we see a real relationship between the two of them and they bat back and forth a little bit and that they're honest with each other and that they have a real intimacy with one another. Uh, we see that he's the, what else? He's got uh, the first guy to go into a, Jewish house, uh, a Gentile household to preach the gospel, even though he was Jewish. Against the law to do so, but through a vision that God gave him, said, here we go, took him to Cornelius' house, led the entire household to the Lord, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Another win. We, we see that he continues in the world, while right? he's predominantly ministering to the Jewish, but his support for Paul, or Saul, who was the, the one that was against the church that came to know Jesus, and he becomes part of his story as well. We see him going out and having a ministry with his wife. I'm not sure people realize, but probably do, that he was married and had kids. They go out and they do ministry together all the way to the end of their lives when they are murdered at the same time. And then you get heaven. Sounds pretty good to me too. Right? So we see a complete and total transformation from someone who is okay to someone who's with the Lord. Here's the challenge sometimes with our testimonies. And this is why I think sometimes we can have unrealistic expectations. Uh, Yes, he's got all this going on. Yes, he's got brothers that he's with. Yes, he's got this Christian community. Yes, he's got this ministry going on. And if that's all that we look at, then people start thinking, if I accept Jesus as leader and forgive of my life, everything's going to be great. And if I join in with the local body church and have community of brothers and sisters too, everything's going to be great. And if I get a cold and say a little prayer, Jesus is going to heal me. And if I struggle financially and I give $30 to this TV pastor, he's going to pay all of my bills and I'm going to be prosperous and I'm going to have all my bills paid. And I'm going to have brothers and sisters who have my back because we're Christians. They're going to love me and they're going to be there for me and everything's going to be peachy keen. And if that is our expectation, when we still live in this world, we're setting ourselves up for a fall. Amen? When a pastor comes in and hurts us, when someone takes and starts backstabbing us in the church, when we ourselves mess up and everybody sees it and they don't know what to do, so they pull back a little bit. Not necessarily because they hate you now, but they just don't know how to handle it. And all of a sudden you're left alone by the people that you thought were going to be there for you. When you look around the room and you don't get anything from the pastor who is singing and you don't get anything from the music when you sing, but you can't deny the fact that the other 40, 50, 60, 100, 400 people seem to be connecting pretty well. It must work for them, but I just, not my DNA. I don't experience it the same. It's not what I thought it was going to be. Things went differently than what I thought. That's when we start seeing testimonies become real. Because Peter got hurt by those guys that he was in the box with. James and John, their mother was hanging out with them. Do you remember his mom going to Jesus and saying, hey, it's great that they're the top three, but can John and James sit on the left hand and the right hand of you in the kingdom of heaven? In other words, are my boys just a little bit better? And Peter's like, what the heck? Right? I mean, what's his response supposed to be? I thought we were all in this. 
And there she is right in front of him. They stab him and they start having a fight about who's going to be greater. He has marks against him when he comes up against the woman and Jesus is talking to the woman at the well, and Samar- uh, the Samaritan woman. It says that they were all baffled. What in the world is he talking to a Samaritan, let alone a woman by himself at the well? What's going on with that? When Matthew joined into the group, Disciples weren't all that thrilled to have a traitor against their own people, have a tax collector hanging out with them. And I really wonder how they felt about having a zealot in their midst. A zealot was a guy that believed that God was going to save us through politics and was really, really cranky about it to the point that they wanted to do war. Not exactly the guy you want to hang out with during the Last Supper, right? Had all kinds of challenges. He had a win when he got out of the boat. And Jesus walked on the water and he says, if that's you, I want to walk on the water too. And he said, come on. And he got out and walked on the boat. No other disciple did that. Then he kind of took his eyes off Jesus and started to sink. Right? Have you ever done that? Start walking out in faith. Next thing you know, you kind of look in another direction and things don't go going south. Here, I'll give him another win. He said, Jesus, help me. He didn't give up and say, well, I guess I drowned on this one. He said, Jesus, help me. He cried out to him and learned from that lesson and continued to move on. There's all kinds of things going on within his life that are great. And even after Jesus died and ascended, he's got another ex going against him when he was taken and hanging out with Paul, the one that he had mentored with the Gentile community. But when some other Jewish people showed up, he started hanging out with the Jewish people and ignoring the Gentile people because he didn't want to take a hit from these. Of what would these guys think of me? And Paul called him out publicly, saying, brother, that's hypocritical in front of all of them. You, that's not okay from what you're doing. He constantly messed up. I love Peter because he constantly messed up like he, I do, right? There's a lot of hits as you look through Peter's life that happens that matches up to the things that you and I go through because we are fallible and we mess up because other people have free will choice and they will sin against you and because sometimes it's just the way it goes in this world. And it will never, ever be easy. Joe, have you had some bad days since you came to know Jesus? Had some people stab you in the back from time to time? Wondered how things were going to go and how you were going to get through the day? Money didn't always work out the way you hoped? I tell you, it is what it is. And for so many people think, it just doesn't feel the way I thought it would. And they disconnect. And they disconnect. From any of the ways that we accept, uh, that we experience Jesus. You might still call yourself a Christian. You might take and say, you know, you still believe but going to church just doesn't feel like I thought it would. It would then, taking and getting into prayer, it just seems like other people can pray and they do these big prayers and I don't even know what to say to him. Getting into the Bible, I, just, I read and I just don't get anything out of it. There's tools to help with that. But don't give up and don't unplug. Because what testimonies do is every time you have one of these hits, instead of dropping down, you go right just back here. Because what that is is an opportunity for a new story, a new testimony, a new encouragement. By getting into, well, this thing's up the dummy, the Bible. By coming back around, getting into some prayer. Even when you don't know what to say, coming back in and plugging into that Christian community, plugging into a local body, church, where others are around you. But just come back to Jesus and repeat. And repeat. I do a lot of Christian counseling. And you guys have heard my testimonies. You've heard when my life passion burned by my own fault when I was stealing money from a place I worked at and was arrested and back in my early 20s and spent some years in probation, never had the, the time that Joe, Joe had. He's, he's like my mentor now on that end of things with the testimony. But, um, but I, I, I wrecked my life. And I, I, I shared that testimony of how God restored it. Now my mom looked at me and said, yes, they've seen what you've done, but now they're looking to see what you do and having that transition back into it. I've had that the times when somebody else, when my first wife left the marriage in an affair, and I had no clue what was going on, how it wrecked my life over time, and can share with you how Jesus brought things back into it. But today, I've got a good wife. Great wife. And I've got a roof over my head, and I've got two incredible kids, and I just got back from visiting my daughter-in-law with my son and my brand new grandbaby from a couple of weeks ago, and I'm blessed that I can take the $200 to take and put towards that. I still got a visa bill, but still, I got $200 to be able to go down and see them and hang out with them. I'm not rich, and I, I'm, you know, got, got my limitations, but things are decently good. And a lot of people that I take and work with from a pastoral care standpoint 
have said, outside looking in, it's easy for you to say because it's working for you. And again, I can spend a lot more time today telling about all the X's in my life and the X's are in my life today. I think it's a little easier to, to see just because of some of the challenges we're going through and we tend to be pretty open and public people anyways. But it's not because everything's off my plate. It's because at least I've learned to keep coming back here. At least I've learned to come back here. And I've learned that it's not about me, but it's about him. I'll give you a scripture uh, up on the screen with Chris's help. When Peter was renamed, this is Matthew 16, verse 18. It says, I tell you, this is Jesus talking to Peter. You are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. When he says you are Peter, which ironically Jesus never calls him Peter again. He always calls him Simon outside of this. But he says, you are Peter, you're the rock, you're the foundation, but I'm the one that's building it. I'm the one that's going to take that, that foundation of you being strong enough to just say, I need you, I need you, I need you, and come back to me. And then I'm going to build on that. I'm going to be the one that makes things happen. I'm going to be the one that continues to move you forward into the continual after of walking with me. And the gates of hell will not prevail. It does not say the gates of hell won't try. It doesn't say that the gates of hell will not be heavy. It does not say the gates of hell will not try to rob, steal, and kill, and destroy from his children because he is lit about how things have gone, and he knows what his future is, and he's got a limited window to hurt God as much as he possibly can by hurting his children. But if you keep saying, yes, I need you back to you, Jesus, I will continue to build, and Satan will not win. Hell will not prevail. It will not take you out. That's the promise. One of my things that I love about Peter's life is one of his big X's. And, I, and you, do you guys anybody want to guess what his big X is? I'll give you three. Yeah, three times. Big time goob. Okay. I don't know if a triple X. That sounds bad. <laughs> Back to Joe's high school days. Okay. Big X. Big, big X. Okay. Um. Jesus comes to, to, to Peter before he's arrested and says, hey, I just want to let you know, spirits, let me know that you're going to deny know, even knowing me three times tonight. And Peter says, you're crazy, you're nuts, I'm never going to do that. Peter should have learned this a long time ago, but he says, I would die for you, that's never going to happen. Jesus takes a little breath and goes, okay, that's cute, I appreciate that, I love your heart, but you are going to deny me three times tonight, and he does. Judas is not the only one to betray Jesus. Simon, Peter, betrays Jesus three times. Third time he does, according to the scripture, he hears the rooster's crow as part of Jesus' prediction. He looks up and he meets eyes with Jesus after he realized that he did the exact thing Jesus said he was going to do. The word used in the original language is only used a couple times in the scripture. It means that he looked deeply, or had a deep, impactful look with Jesus in this moment. One of the only other times that we see it in the scripture is the section we just read in Luke where it says that they looked at each other right after this miraculous catch and he said, I'm not worthy. Just leave me. I'm not worthy. It was a soul-penetrating look. The exact same one. And Peter in that moment realized, I was right all along. I'm not worthy of this. I'm not worthy of this. And he went out weeping bitterly. Bitterly. That word only used a couple times in the scripture. It matches the weeping that Judas did after he realized what he did. And he left. When Jesus comes back to life, I have no idea how Peter feels about looking into those eyes again, knowing what had happened. But he struggled. He struggled. So much so that what we find, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about John 21. I'm not going to read from it. I'm just going to kind of sum it up. But um, we'll put it up on the screen. Yeah, if you write that down and read it today, it's awesome. Just awesome. And one of, one of my favorite uh, stories within Peter's testimony. But Peter gets to the point that he gives up. Kind of. He doesn't say, I'm renouncing my faith. He just says, I think I'll go back to fishing. That's what I was good at. That's what I can do. And some of his friends, I'm assuming John and James and probably Andrew, that were in the mix, said, okay, we'll go out and join you. They knew Peter was having a tough time of it. He goes out, fishes all night. Do you guys remember how many fish he catches? <laughs> Zero. Just like the first time they met Jesus. Nothing goes well for him today. 
And as they're coming back in and they're pulling up the nets, a guy from the shoreline yells out, Hey, guys, didn't you catch any fish? No one likes that guy. <laughs> right? Nobody likes that guy. It's like, no, we didn't catch any fish. Thanks, loser. And he says, well, cast off on the other side. Now, you have to understand, this is, that, that's not just an inconvenience. That's almost improbable because of the sides of the ship. One side is low so you can throw the nets. The other side is uh, that blocks the wind. It's got a wall on it. But if it gets the guy off, I'm just defeated. Just whatever. Just throw him on the other side. Miraculous catch. Everything's going crazy. Somebody says, it's Jesus. And he's right back to where he was three years before with the exact same miracle, with the exact same feelings, but he has learned this one thing, I need him. I need him. He didn't say, nope, I'm not worthy of that, so I'm just going to stay on the boat. He jumps in the water, he swims to the boat, and comes up onto the beach, and Jesus is sitting there with a campfire made of coals. Anybody try to grill with coals? Doesn't happen fast. I like the gas grill, I'm lazy. Jesus has been sitting there for a little while. He's warmed up the coals. They're nice warm. He makes him breakfast, and he feeds him breakfast. I will say this every time I talk about this story. That's insane to me, the amount of love that Jesus has for them. He only has 40 days from the time that he has come out of the grave to when he has to go back home, and he has time to sit and give him breakfast because he loves him. And this is when he says, Simon, Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know I love you. Then feed my sheep. Simon, do you truly love me? You know I love you, Lord. Three times he asks him, to a point that Peter's almost hurt, but completely reinstates Peter back in. The secret of him continuing to these other areas is he just comes back to Jesus. And some of us have stopped doing that. Some of us have given up on Jesus, but some of us have decided okay is well enough because I don't have to deal with these exes if I'm okay. I'm working my job, I got the marriage, everything's fine and good but okay is good enough for me. That's not what you're created for. It's just not what you're created for. You're going to have X's and you're going to have explanation points and you're going to have good and you're going to have bad. But the secret's just simply don't give up. And don't try to do it by yourself. We need Him. We need each other. We need prayer. We need Scripture. We need to sing together and to dance with each other and laugh with one another. But don't give up. One of my favorite stories when it comes to Peter as well is not a biblical one as much as it is a church history one. Uh, we do have history outside of the, of the scripture from outside authors. And as I shared with you a few moments ago, that's where I pulled the information about Peter having this incredible ministry with his wife and that they were martyred on the same day. And according to the history, she was taken first to be killed, tortured and killed for her faith, and Peter was taken next. So even to the end, they were pretty much together, walked into heaven together, which is awesome. As she left, according to the history, they encouraged each other, and they sang together. And as she was pulled towards crucifixion, He yelled out to her, remember the Lord. That is what he had been living his entire life. Not always perfect, but it's what kept him going. And it's what took them into the heavenly kingdom when these exes are just no more. And I think one of the biggest encouragements we can do to one another is just say, remember the Lord. When you're struggling with your faith, you don't know what to do about your money or your time, and you don't know what to do about somebody who's been treating you badly in the background, or you're struggling with a sinful desire that you just don't know if you can continue to do or to deal with, or maybe you, it fell apart on, remember the Lord. Remember the Lord. Keep coming back and continue having these testimonies of His goodness and His faithfulness. If there's any way that we can be a part of that, we want to be. but do not here, at least with him. Please be with him. If he leads you someplace else, we'll help you get connected there. Joe's got a pretty good church family. There's many others out there as well. But remember the Lord, remember to plug into him, and be encouraged.